Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Bedouins fight for survival in the Negev as Israel issues home demolition orders. Debate over the silencing of Iranian media in the West tests freedom of speech. And online campaign against the oppression of Arab women draws thousands. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. In the occupied territories, hundreds of Arab Bedouins protested in the Negev in front of the Israeli interior minister in Bir Sabeh against the demolition of their houses and the plans to expel them from their homes. A general strike prevailed in most of the Arab communities in the Negev. The Arabs in the Negev unleashed a cry of anger against the Israeli institution. They say that demolishing their homes and the plans to expel them is a red line that will be faced with force. They chose the headquarters of the interior ministry in Beira Sabe that is responsible for implementing this plan as a site to protest what they consider a policy of systematic ethnic cleansing against them. They will not be able to break our will through this process. We are demanding the recognition of our villages, and we are calling on the authorities to stop demolishing our homes. We came from Bir Haddad to defend our homeland. This is our homeland, and we will never give it up. 30,000 out of the 190,000 Bedouins living in the Negev are facing the danger of immediate expulsion and the confiscation of 850,000 dunams, or 210,040 acres, of their lands. Israel is seeking to place them in eight residential communities that were specifically created for that purpose. The Bedouins reject this plot and are resisting it with all possible legal and popular means. They are not ruling out an escalation of their protests by announcing civil disobedience and engaging in a violent confrontation with the Israeli authorities. If the government does not back down from its policy of expulsion and uprooting, then civil disobedience is inevitable. We're warning the Israeli government, pressure leads to an explosion. It is a battle for survival and existence, a battle the Arabs in the Negev are waging almost daily to assert that they are the landowners and not invaders, as Israel is trying to portray them. This is the village of Umm al-Khiran, located 30 kilometers south of Bar al-Sabeh. The entire village is threatened with destruction and its 1,000 residents are facing expulsion and an unknown fate. The Abu al-Qiyan tribe primarily settled here in 1956 after it was expelled three consecutive times since the Nakba of 1948. Its residents say they will not accept to be displaced a fourth time. We will resist until the last moment because there is no alternative for us. The only alternative is to return us to Zubela, our land, our ancestors' land, or to recognize our village here. Umm al Khiran is one of 36 villages dispersed in the Negev desert that Israel does not recognize. It will meet the same fate of demolition and expulsion that has become a daily scene for its residents. Elias Karam, Al Jazeera, the Negev desert. Now to the U.S., where the debate on free speech continues with the ban on Iranian TV and radio stations. Reactions range from support to outrage. Press TV's Marjan Asi has the story from Washington. The war of words has reached Washington. UTELSAT's ban on 19 Iran-based television and radio stations has met with mixed results in the U.S. Capitol. Cliff Kincaid of the conservative media group Accuracy in Media supports the ban as a reasonable tool of sanctions. People have access to all kinds of information through the Internet, uh, through YouTube, uh, but uh, decisions have been made by the governments involved that sanctions require uh, that satellite providers not provide this access to press TV and other Iranian channels. Uh, that does nothing uh, to limit freedom of speech at all. But others disagree. According to a Washington, D.C.-based journalist, the ban highlights the lack of media freedom. People need to have access to uh, as many sources of information um, as possible. And, you know, I think, you know, this just goes to show, you know, again, how uh, controlled and limited um, 
this, uh, you know, the, the, the media landscape, you know, so to speak, is. When they put up these pornographic cartoons that denigrate Islam or they ban the hijab in France, this is freedom of speech. But when you have quality news that represents views from all over the world, that's something that needs to be stopped. Although press TV is not broadcast on cable television in the U.S., it can still be viewed via satellite. And it's still available via UTELSAT, despite being denied access to broadcasting in Europe, though not under the same frequency. Proponents of the European media blackout here in Washington, D.C., have taken their support for the ban a step further, asking that any government-sponsored news channels be labeled agents of foreign countries. They say this is allowed under American legislation known as the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Some journalists and media advocates disagree, stating a diverse media is important for balanced and well-rounded coverage. Any time you know, somebody would attempt to, 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 to ban from somebody else from talking, um, I think it's uh, a lot less likely that they're concerned about the person lying than they are about the person telling the truth. In the latest developments, European Union spokesperson Maya Kostjancic has denied UTELSAT statements that the satellite provider was required by the EU Commission to drop the Iranian channels. Marjan Asi, Press TV, Washington. A bold women's uprising is taking place in the Arab virtual world. My colleague Yumna Fawaz reports. A virtual uprising is being waged by women, most of whom do not dare to take such a step in the real world. So they turn to Facebook to freely express themselves, without any restrictions, and away from the pressures of their communities. With unfamiliar boldness and without any taboos, they are using different slogans and have a variety of demands. I am with the uprising of women in the Arab world because I am free and my body and virginity and life belong to me. Because I don't want my niece to feel as if it's her duty to hide her intelligence to please someone else's ego. Because I am not deficient in intellect or religion. The idea started with a Lebanese woman residing in France named Yalda, who started a Facebook page titled The Uprising of Women in the Arab World. The page of this virtual uprising grew and spread across the Arab world. It is to demand the freedom and rights of women all over the Arab world. The goal of the page is to connect many Arab countries together so we can work together to get our rights. This campaign was welcomed so much it was really astonishing. And the participants are being so daring. They are showing their faces and using their names and saying they support the uprising of women in the Arab world because, in one case, quote, I was sexually harassed when I was seven years old. A woman who says, this is my body and it is no one's business, on the street would probably get killed or maybe raped. If artists and celebrities can join us, it would be wonderful because they have a louder voice and a following. We need to talk about this issue. People need to accept this idea. From the virtual world to the real world, we took a quick tour to test women's support for the uprising of women. This reality could somewhat explain the reason women have still been unable to attain many of their rights. Many were not shy to respond, nor did they reject the issue, while others viewed it as an opportunity to express themselves. I am with the uprising of women in the Arab world. No, I'm not. No, I am for freedom for all the people. I'm with the uprising of women because their rights are unattained. I am with the uprising of Arab women because women are unable to drive a car and can't pass their citizenship to their kid. I am with the uprising of women in the Arab world because they're not free. Because she doesn't have her rights and is very oppressed. So before men are convinced, it is important to persuade some women in Arab societies of the importance of the struggle for the liberation
liberation of women. الإخبارية التي نبدأها بأخبار سوريا حيث قالت لجان التنسيق المحلية إن عدد القتلى. In Syria, the local coordination committee said the number of people killed today rose to over 120. The coordination committee said the cities that witnessed the most killings are Aleppo, Damascus in its countryside, Idlib and Homs. Opposition members say the shelling reached areas in the countryside of Damascus, Aleppo, Idlib, Dara, Homs, Hama, Dirzur and Al Kumaitra. Activists from Dara said the Syrian army. sustained losses in equipment during violent clashes in the town of Alija. On another front, the BBC's correspondent in Damascus reported an explosive device was detonated near Uthman Mosque in the Kafar Suza area, causing an explosion that led to material damages. No casualties were reported. Some opposition sources said the explosion targeted a security branch in the area. However, official sources still have not confirmed the targeting of a military branch. As for political contacts related to the crisis in Syria, the UN and Arab envoy to Syria, Lakhdar Brahimi, said that if the Syrian crisis continues, it will no longer be confined within the Syrian borders, but will extend to the region. Brahimi met this morning with Jordanian Foreign Minister Nasser Judah in Amman. This visit comes as part of the round of negotiations conducted by Brahimi with neighboring countries on ways to confront the escalating crisis. Call the crisis what you like. If it continues, it will not remain confined within the Syrian borders, but will impact the region and beyond. People are asking, how will it be monitored? No, it won't be monitored. This is an appeal to the Syrians themselves. They must quit the fighting and they must monitor themselves. This is not part of the political process. اتهمت مجموعة أفاز الناشطة في مجال حقوق الإنسان القوات الحكومية السورية. The Avaz Human Rights Organization accused Syrian government forces and pro-regime armed groups of causing the disappearance of between 28,000 and 80,000 people since demonstrations calling for toppling the regime erupted nearly a year ago. Avaz confirmed it plans to present a file with all the documents to the UN Human Rights Council. حملة من الإرهاب المتعمد يقوم بها النظام السوري. The Syrian regime is enforcing a deliberate strategy. strategy to terrorize people. With these words, the Avaz Human Rights Organization described the abductions and disappearances it accuses government forces and pro-regime armed groups of conducting with the aim of terrorizing families and individuals. In its report, the organization added that regime forces are abducting women from the street and farmers on their way to buy fuel, and others in front of their children, saying they are later thrown in torture cells. On the basis of figures released by Syrian rights organizations, Avaz indicated the number of missing people is at least 28,000, and the number of those whose fate is unknown and are neither dead nor in exile could reach 80,000. There are tapes that clearly show security or army forces abducting people from the streets. They are not fighters, but are peaceful protesters. They are people who supported the peaceful movement and now have vanished. The organization interviewed Syrian refugees abroad who offered testimonies about their missing relatives, and each has a story of suffering. My daughter, my brother, we are homeless. We didn't do anything. Our homes were destroyed. I don't know what they did to my daughter. My honor was insulted. My honor was insulted. The children need a father in their lives. It was very difficult for them to adapt. I had a very hard time explaining his absence. They always ask me, where is dad? Who took him? The Syrian authorities usually do not reveal the number of prisoners they hold. However, the Syrian president provided a number of the prisoners released under the amnesty decree, and every once in a while, the authorities release dozens whose hands, they say, are not stained with blood. 
Every detainee arrested is held by the official security agencies the exact time it takes to investigate. Then the judiciary deals with their case and it takes the necessary measures. The state must admit to the arrests. Why wouldn't it admit to them since it took them into custody on the basis of documented charges? Mm. <laughs> However, rights organizations are calling for the immediate release of thousands of prisoners whose fate is unknown. Avaz confirmed it plans to present the file of the disappeared to the UN Human Rights Council. As for the relatives of the missing, all of these efforts are mere words that do not ease their great suffering. A series of explosions rocked the Yemeni capital, Sana'a. According to a statement by the Ministry of Defense, they were caused by an explosion in an arms and ammunition depot of the 1st Armored Division that is headed by Major General Ali Mohsen al-Akhmar. It led to the killing of one soldier and one civilian. Seventeen people were also injured. Eyewitnesses in the area surrounding the 1st Division in the center of the capital said a number of rockets fell on neighborhoods near the division, in addition to shrapnel. They indicated witnessing a plane hovering over the area directly after the explosion and the large deployment of armed supporters of Sheikh Hamid al-Akhmar. The Yemeni Ministry of Defense's website had confirmed the incident was an accident that left no victims. <laughs> Joining us over the phone from Sana'a is our correspondent Abdul Rahman al-Shumari. Abdul Rahman, are there details about the series of explosions in Sana'a? <laughs> There are reports that indicate that the series of explosions that occurred today at 11 a.m. Sana'a time was caused by a Katusha rocket. They say the rocket targeted the weapons depot as a group of the 1st Armored Division was training in the middle of the division square, which caused this violent explosion. Meanwhile, a statement by the division states that it was caused by a short circuit. The series of explosions, which exceeded 10, started at approximately 11 a.m. Sana'a time. They caused panic and fear among the citizens. Students fled their schools, especially those near the northern area of the 1st Armored Division that has a very dense population. People panicked and feared a return of the confrontations between supporters of the former president and soldiers of the 1st Armored Division, so everyone on the streets was confused. Soldiers of the division who are active in the area heightened their security measures on traffic and inspected passing cars. In general, these explosions caused fear among all the residents of Sana'a. The confrontations were making a comeback. The shrapnel from these explosions even reached areas far away from the 1st Armored Division. On the outskirts of the Libyan city of Bani Walid, 11 people were killed as a result of the armed clashes, ongoing for two days, between members loyal to the regime of the late President Muammar al-Gaddafi and the militias of the former revolutionaries. This comes as the Libyan military announced its readiness to enter and station government units in the city. The leadership of the military staff confirmed that this decision aims to impose security in the city and to bring the perpetrators to justice. The decision was preceded by by a visit of a delegation known as the rulers of Libya to the area. They communicated the readiness of the leaders to cooperate with the government's armed forces in spreading the state's control over these areas. A new poll in Haaretz gives a center super party a lead over Likud, but former Kadima leaders Ehud Almert and Sipi Livni remain mum on election plans. Here with that and other election news making headlines today is IBA's political reporter, Ellie Wagelander. Ellie? Yes, Laura, political news making headlines all day. Former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert met with his successor as Kadima leader, Sipi Livni, for more than an hour and a half at an undisclosed location last night in order to discuss their possible joint political future. Sources said the two talked about many different political constellations that could bring success, but one scenario was ruled out completely. There is no chance that one of them will run against the other. Either they will join together in one party, 
or one or both of them will not run. They agreed to meet again next week after each has decided their political future on their own. Labor, labor leader Shelly Yakimovich said she would welcome Livni to her party if she decides to join without Olmert. One barometer Olmert might use to help make his decision is where he stands in the polls being conducted almost daily. According to an Arts poll released today, a party headed by Olmert, Livni and political newcomer Yair Lapid would defeat Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party. The poll shows the Super Party gaining 25 seats to Likud's 24, with Labor gaining 17, Shas 14, Yisrael Baitenu 13, and Meretz 4. But should Olmert not run and Livni joins with Labor, that party won't defeat Likud, but it will come pretty close. Likud would still win the, with the most seats, with 27. Labor would pick up 24, Yisrael Baitenu 13, Shas 11, Lapid's Yeshatid 10, Kadima 7, and Meretz 5. The survey also indicated, however, that whatever its composition, a right-wing bloc would not lose its Knesset majority, and thus Netanyahu would more than likely be chosen to form the next government. Today marks one year since the release of former Hamas captive, IDF soldier Gilad Shalit, in an exchange deal with Hamas for more than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. We get more on this report from IBA's Aaron Viner. After extensive negotiations spanning more than five years, IDF soldier Gilad Shalit returned home to Israel on October 18, 2011. Caught up in the national sentiment, legendary Israeli singer Arik Einstein released a song on the eve of Gilad's release called simply, Now That You Are Here. Shalit took some time in getting his life back in order. President Shimon Peres made a personal visit to the Shalit family home immediately after the release, expressing empathy for the suffering of the soldier, who was just 19 at the time of his abduction. The month after his release, the 25-year-old released a videotape expressing his gratitude to all of his supporters. Shalit made his first trip abroad in February to Paris, where he expressed his thanks to the French people and then-President Nicolas Sarkozy. Prime Minister Netanyahu wished Shalit a happy Passover in March and commended him on gaining weight. He added that the holiday, celebrating the Jewish people's freedom from Egypt, this year also signified an exodus from Gaza. As a sports enthusiast, Shalit appeared at many events, including an NBA All-Star game in the United States, and he visited the Maccabi Tel Aviv basketball team in May. He now writes a sports column for the Idiot Ochronot newspaper. In New York this June, Shalit was presented with a thick book that included tens of thousands of letters written to him during his captivity. When one Jew is captive, every Jew is a captive. And your freedom is our freedom. Hamas today celebrated the anniversary of the exchange, vowing to continue its jihad war against Israel, as well as the abduction of additional Israeli soldiers. According to the defense establishment, dozens of the 1,027 Palestinians exchanged for Shalit have resumed terrorist activity. While many victims of terror opposed the deal, others, including the mother of Marla Bennett, who was murdered in a 2000 bombing at Hebrew University by one of the released terrorists, expressed her support. I'm just happy he's home. Try to look at the bright side. And I know that my daughter, if she was here, would say that too. During his first television interview on Channel 10 last night, Shalit described passing his time in captivity by making maps of Israel and his hometown and playing makeshift sports. Now that he has regained his freedom, health, and has a job, Shalit said that his next goal is to fall in love. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. The Palestinian Prisoner Society organized a sit-in in solidarity with prisoner Mohammed Al-Taj, who is in a critical medical condition and has difficulty breathing. The protesters warned that Al-Taj's condition is now serious, placing the full responsibility for the prisoner's life on the occupation authorities. I appeal to the entire world, the Arab and Muslim and foreign communities, everyone, and those with a conscience to seriously stand with Muhammad. Because Muhammad defended the Al-Aqsa Mosque a great deal, his goal is one, and that is to defend Al-Aqsa above everything else. He is now at a dangerous stage and has difficulty breathing, and there is inflammation around his lungs, so he is now surviving with an oxygen mask in prison. 
the situation is equal to killing the prisoner, Mohammed al-Taj. We must quickly work now to secure his release so that we can provide him with medical treatment on the outside, because leaving him in prison is sentencing him to death. The time has come for releasing prisoner Mohammed al-Taj and all Palestinian prisoners in the jails of the occupation. The time has also come for those who claim to hold the principles of freedom and democracy in the free world to take a serious stance and take action to stop these crimes that are committed in the prisons of the occupation against female and male detainees. We asked a lawyer to visit him tomorrow to look at his medical file and to prepare an appropriate plea before the medical board. I hope he will be released the day after tomorrow and that he will directly and immediately be given an intensive treatment. If required, I'm sure our brother the president and the Ministry of Health will provide it on time. I hope Israel doesn't hinder his transfer to any place that could save his life. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.